tumultuous political period in our history, what to do? And it became dramatic because Roosevelt dies just at the beginning of that period. And he was the, remember, he was the president elected four times. That's why we have a law in the United States now that you can't be president more than twice. Because there was so much upset that he had become, I don't know, let's say, pick a moderate um, metaphor, Hugo Chavez. Right? A person who stays. Or maybe I'd better pick Bloomberg, a person who stays, you know, <laughs> stays. Um, and people don't like that often. And uh, so Roosevelt was dead, and this, excuse me, but I'll, you know, to be colorful, this hick from the Midwest, Harry Truman, that no one ever heard of, sort of the federal version of Mr. Patterson, our governor, who became president, well, Patterson became president, bec uh, governor, because the other governor, dot, dot, dot. And so in that case, Roosevelt didn't do that, or at least we have no record of it, but he died, which has, if you see what happened to Spitzer, is about the same. <laughs> he vanishes, you know, it sort of vanishes, and uh, somebody else comes in, and he may be a good one or a bad one, but he kind of falls into this job when no one expected him to, and that's not a good person to have, and it's such a difficult moment in your society. And plus, the great alliance of the Second World War, some of you... Your history may not remember this, so it's important to tell you. The great alliance of the Second World War was the alliance of the United States and the Soviet Union. And in American post offices across America, there was a big picture hanging over the door. Uncle Sam, arm in arm with Uncle Joe. Uncle Joe for Joseph. For Joseph Stalin. So when everybody in America, in little dipsy doodle Minnesota, bought a postage stamp, they had a beaming Stalin who looked down on them as they did it, right? It's important that you understand that. So the Great Alliance was now the great conflict, real quick. The two winners, big winners, went after each other. Uh, but there was a big difference. One winner had just dropped atomic bombs on people which made the other winner very frightened. The Soviets, if you ever look at the records, thought that the reason the United States dropped the bomb on Japan was to send the Russians a message. Whether that's true or not, no one will ever know. But the thought was enough. And so the Russians went to work to develop that own, their own atomic weapon, which they very quickly did. And were a very difficult time. Some of the worst strikes ever to strike American industry happened in 1947 and 48. The reaction of the business community was violent to these strikes. They passed, they got rammed through the Congress in a terror, something called the Taft-Hartley Act of 1947, which radically limits the power of unions, has ever since. It's the great hope of the unions today that Obama will undo that. Taft-Hartley rule. The most important part of the Taft-Hartley law, 1947, basically said two things. One, it is illegal for a communist to be the head or an elected official of a union. We hadn't done that before. Your political perspective disqualifies you from being the head of a union. And number two, anything won by a union in a contract, whether by striking or any other method, must be given to every worker at the worksite whether or not that worker is in the union and whether or not that worker joins the union and whether or not that worker pays dues to the union. In other words, it created for every worker the incentive to not join and not pay for the union since they were to get whatever the union got in any case. This is not good for unions, in case any of you have ever wondered about that. That is a very rough time and it had to do with the fear that we were going to slide back in to the Great Depression. So great was the fear that many things about our economy since, which we're going to talk about a little bit later when we explain how the crisis developed, come out of that time. So what happens in 1917 in Russia? Is there a revolution? Yes. Is it run by Marxists? Yes. Is it, are the big new leaders, Lenin, Stalin, Trotsky? Yes. Did they take pri private property away from the mass of people? No. Let me do that again. No. The mass of people in Russia in 1917 were farmers. 90 plus percent of the people were agrarian. The revolution took property away from the big landowners and distributed to the individual peasant family. 
and they kept that property for the next 10 years. 19, more than that, the next 12 years. From 1970 to 1929, the Soviet Revolution guaranteed private property in land for the mass of people who had only land and nothing else. The notion that they took away private property is simply wrong. Even after 1929, when they had something called the collectivization of agriculture in Russia, the land was not taken by the state. Most of the land was given to something called collective farms, groups of farmers who owned the land privately. What the state took was industry, not agriculture. And agriculture was where the overwhelming majority of people were. So they allowed, by the way, each private farmer made his own decisions about what to produce and how to produce. The farms in Russia where most of the people were, were privately owned, private enterprises guaranteed by the Soviet government. And the reason the Soviet government survived, remember the revolution in 1917 is made by the Bolshevik party. That's a party of, you know, a few thousand people in a country of many millions. How was that possible? It was possible because they said to the mass of peasants, we gave you your land. We guarantee your land. If our revolution is overthrown, welcome back to serfdom. And the mass of peasants said, gotcha, we support the communists. You all know the history. I know you don't, but I'm going to pretend. You all know the history. 1917 is a revolution. Bolsheviks take power. 1918, with the active help of the Western capitalist countries, a civil war breaks out in Russia. A red army to support the government and a white army trying to overthrow them. Okay. In 1918, helping the white army, the Soviet Union is invaded by armies from four countries. Britain, France on the west, Japan invades on the east, and one more country. What country do you think that might have been? The United States. 10,000 American troops land and invade Russia. Okay, so just footnote. The Uni I can see from your faces i got to do this. The United States invaded the Communist Soviet Union. They never invaded us. So ask yourself, who's got what right to be afraid of whom in this history? Anyway, foreign troops helping the whites stayed until 1922. The revolution is in 1917. For five years at the beginning, this new fledgling government is faced with a world war, World War I, that it basically lost. It's the loser at the time the war is over. A civil war, a foreign invasion from the four most powerful countries in the world. It beats them all. Which, by the way, surprised Lenin and Stalin at least as much as everybody else. And it did that because it had the support of the peasantry. Very important for you to understand. So it's not what you might think it was. It's a kind of state capitalism where the state takes a tremendous role, more than anything that happened in Roosevelt's America. But you know what the big difference was? In Roosevelt's America, uh, the government controlled industry, did this social security, started unemployment compensation, never had that before, and all that. But what the United States state never did is it never took over industries. It robbed the industries of many of their private decisions. You mentioned earlier, correctly, during the war, rationing. Again, just to make sure you all know. What is rationing? Rationing is when the government says, we are not going to use markets anymore as the mechanism of distribution. A market means the person who gets the tomatoes is the person who offers the most money for the tomatoes. That's what a market does. So if there's more people who want tomatoes and have money, then there are tomatoes to satisfy the demand. Then the people with the money begin to bid up the price of the tomatoes. So I offer $8. You offer $9. We keep on going until I drop out because I'm not going to pay that much. So the tomatoes go to the person who stays the longest and offers the most. So a market is a way of distributing goods to those most able to pay. When a government decides that it doesn't want the market anymore, as the United States government did in World War II, it sets up a system called rationing. Here's how rationing works. The government prints little pieces of paper. 
They're called ration tickets or ration coupons. And it distributes them to people, which is what the United States government does. Many other countries have done that too. And it distributes them according to some standard. Here in America, the standard was how many people are in your family? What are their ages? Stuff like that. And so you get a number of tickets. And here the law then becomes the following. A store can sell you a pound of sugar, a quart of milk, you know, whatever, a gallon of gasoline or whatever, and you have to pay with two, th two objects. You have to give money, like you always did, and you have to give a ration ticket entitling you to a gallon of gas or a quart of milk or a pound of sugar or 50 grams of meat or whatever it is. Either one by itself, you don't get the object. And a store who sells you the object without the two is going to be arrested. It's a crime. Wow. That means that goods get distributed not only according to the amount of money you have, but to according to some government idea of how distribution ought to be done, say by age or family size or whatever criteria they use. That's a government that is uh, abrogating markets. That's a government that is in truth. So the, the, the government under Roosevelt did those things and many more. But it never took the industry. It never basically said, okay, we're not just going to regulate you, control you, limit you, take this decision away from you. We're taking another step. Bye-bye. You're gone. And instead of the, the board of directors elected by the shareholders, which is how corporations work, the board of directors is elected by the government and put in its job. The board of directors becomes a government official, a set of government officials. That's what the Soviet Union did. It told the private directors, go away. By the way, when that didn't work, after a few years, Lenin, when he was still up, brings